Today I'm gonna take you Mark through some through some stories of mine that you know that are true. You know what I mean? Um, I was a young man. Are the others you know, and, are the others not true? Oh, they're all true. They're all true. <laughs> Everyone I tell you is true. You know what I mean? Um, I'm gonna take you through the age today. You know, uh, when I was about 13 years old, I think maybe 13 or 14 years old, I was going around stealing cars. You know, my homie came to me at school and he's like, Hey, you know, your average 14, 13 year old wouldn't be doing the things that I'm gonna share with you guys, but you know, I'm sharing it today because you know I want a lot of 13 or 14 year olds out there to know that. Everything is not precious and big with being a gang member. You know, everything is not the way they think, you know, the way they portray it, the way they paint a picture of it. You know, there's a lot of reality that shit happens to you and it haunts you in the long run. Well, when I was about 13, 14, you know, my homie came to school and he was like, hey, man, he had a shoebox. And I was what's that? You know, so he opens the shoebox and I see like maybe there's like 300 keys and they're all the same keys. And I tell him, well, he goes, go ahead and grab a handful. And I'm like, what do I want a handful for? They're all the same key, I'll just take one. He said, well, they're the master keys to all Toyota Celicas from 87 all the way to 90. And I'm like, what do you mean they're the master keys? He said, you could open the door, you could start the ignition, the trunk. I said, all right, so he gives me a handful, I put it in my pocket. Well, that night, I get ready, you know, and it takes me about an hour to get ready because I want to crease my pants, you know what I mean? I want to crease, man, I even crease my underwear, to tell you the truth. So I get all creased up, ready to go, put on my headband, and um, we go to a party. Me and my homegirls, we go to a party, we're kicking it over there, and I had my handband real, real low. I used to wear my shit low where I could see everybody at waist level. You know what I mean? I wasn't worried about their face. I was more worried about their hands. You know, I used to watch their hands, you know, see if they were reaching their pockets, if they would touch their waist. You know, I was really on it, you know, and I got schooled by my uncles. They told me, always watch a man's hands and his waist, you know. That'll tell you everything if he reaches in his pockets when you get close to him or any sort of movement. So, you know. I got my bandana real, real low and my homegirl tells me, hey, let's, let's jam, you know? So I'm like, all right, we're up there in Whittier. And I tell her, well, you know what? I don't feel like walking. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna go search around the area and I'm gonna see if I can find us a car to take, you know? And she says, how are you gonna take it? Because at that time, I didn't know how to hotwire yet. yet. So I told her I got the master keys to Toyota Celicas. So lo and behold, I'm walking. I see this Toyota Celica, man. It got some rims on it. It's like a light brown. It's maybe like a tan color. I look inside it, badass stereo, the interior is like leather. It's like, it's a brand new Toyota Celica. It's probably about an 89. We're in that year, so I'm thinking it's about Christmas time, right about Christmas. So I get in, I open the door, I put it in the door, it opens, I get in, I start it. I'm like, oh fuck, it's a stick shift, you know? I learned how to drive stick shift, but I learned how to drive in stolen cars. I must have burned about shit, about 15 clutches as I'm going through, you know, each car on burning clutches, burning clutches, and I just leave the car there, you know? A couple I would drive to the riverbed and park them, you know what I mean? So the streets won't get that hot, you know? I tell you, I'm not your average 13, 14 year old. My mind's thinking a little bit quicker than others, you know? I'm getting, I'm, I'm listening a lot to what people are saying, you know, at that time, because I want to be that gangster that everybody fears, everybody wants to be, everybody, you know, wants to hang around with. I just wanted to be that guy. So I get this car, I'm inside it, I start it up, I put it in first gear, everything's going cool. I grind it in the second, grind it in the third. I turn around the corner. My homegirl's not there. She's there with her sister, her other sister, and two of my homies from another hood. They're all right there, and I'm gonna tell you about a They're not all that big. So they all wanna get in. I'm thinking, fuck it, it's a G ride anyways. Everybody get in, so everybody gets in. Boom, we get in. Well, my homie gets in the side of me, and he tells me, hey, I got something right here. And I said, what you got? So he shows me, right? He got the strap, right? So I'm like, oh shit, all right, cool, let's go. So we go, we're searching, we're looking, you know, we're gonna go gang bang, we're gonna go shoot somebody, bottom line. So as we're going, we cruise down the street where my sister used to live, and I knew a lot of dudes used to kick it from the enemy hood right there by my sister's house. So we cruise up, boom, we go. At this time, I had switched places with the homie, he wanted to drive, I wanted to do the deed. So we go, we hit a corner, we see these fools kicking back on a porch, you know what I mean, I do my thing, I put my beanie real low, I go, and I bust on these fools. Now, I don't know if I hit anybody, I heard some screaming, I seen some people falling, but I don't know if I ever really hurt anybody or hit anybody, but I shot at them. So as we shoot at them, I jump in the shotgun seat, we're going, and we start hitting these dips. We're going down the street, and he's hauling ass, and we're hitting these dips, boom. And we're hitting them so hard that sparks are coming out of the back of the car, and I'm telling him, slow down, slow down, we're all right, we're all right. He's like, no, I just seen a cop at the, at the, at the last block. So I'm like, so as soon as we hit a corner, a cop turns the corner and we're face to face with him. He's at a stop sign, we're at a stop sign. I got the gun in my hand, I have gloves on. I'm like, oh shit. I go, look, man, drive as fast as you can. I go, a matter of fact, 
let's switch places. So right in front of the cup, we switch places. I just shot so I feel I want to drive. I don't want to leave him to drive because I'm not going to trust in him. I'm going to trust in my driving. So I get in the driver's seat. The cop sees everything goes down. He pulls up on the side of me, tells me, hey, uh, do you have license and registration? I look at him, I tell him, you don't see how young I am? I'm like 13, 14 years old. He's asking me for, for license and registration. I know he can see how young I am. I don't have no facial hair or nothing. I'm real young. So I tell him, yeah, yeah, I got it. So I play him off. I'm, I'm about to pull over. I pull over to the side. I keep it in, I keep, I put it in neutral. I'm looking through my mirror and I see him. You know, he's doing his thing. He gets off the car. As soon as he gets off and he closes his door, fuck it, I put it in first. Boom, let's go. I tell my homegirls, man, I'm not stopping for nothing. There are no fucking red lights, no stop signs. I'm not stopping for nobody. So we come out this, this residential street. We're going, I must be doing about 45. We come out to this, to this main street and I turn and the whole car slides to the other side of the street. We barely miss this old man coming in a, in a truck. We barely miss him. I mean, I can see the dude's face like we're looking right at each other. Our cars slide right by each other, right? So I'm going. Here we come. Now I'm going down Norwalk Boulevard, and it has nothing but main streets that run through it. I got about a quarter mile maybe to get to my hood, and I'm like, man, I ain't stopping. So as I'm, as I'm going, I'm telling my homeboys and homegirls, I'm not stopping for no red lights. Lo and behold, here we come up to a red light. I tell them, look, everybody just duck. That's all I could tell them. Just duck. I'm a duck. We're going to go through the red light. So as we hit the first red light, I remember, I tell them, duck, and I duck, and we go through the red light. I don't want to see if anybody's going to hit me, you know what I mean? I don't, I'm just saying, fuck it, let's go. So we went ran one red light, boom, we go. We're hauling ass. I can hear the sirens, but I can't see behind me because my homegirl, she has one of those big-ass hairdos they used to wear back then. I guess it was a cha-cha. I can't see through the fucking rearview mirror. I'm not even tripping to look through the side mirror. I'm trying to see through the rearview to see how far they are behind me. Lo and behold, they're way back there, but I can hear the sirens, so I'm thinking they're right behind me. I must be doing about 60, 65. We're on the main street. Here comes another fucking light. It's red again, so I'm like, fuck, everybody get down. I get down, put my head down the steering wheel, we go through it. Woo. We just go through it. I hear cars almost hit me, horns blasting. We go through and I'm thinking, okay, now what the fuck am I gonna do? How am I gonna get away from these motherfuckers? They're behind me, I know there's at least four cars behind me because as I'm going down the streets, I see the cars of the cops parked on each main street that I'm passing. They're waiting to get in back of me, you know what I mean? So I pass them, boom, I see them, boom. So we're going, there must be about four or five cars behind me. But I'm hauling ass, now I'm doing about 60, 65. And I'm hauling ass and I'm thinking, there's little residential streets. I'm thinking I'm gonna turn down a residential street, stop the car, everybody get off and run. Whoever gets caught, gets caught. Well, as I'm going, I turn down this little residential street and my fucking car doesn't turn. It fucking locks up. It just locks up, I guess, with all the weight of everybody. It's so small of a car that it locks up and it slides. And where it slides into is this feed store where my father used to take me when I was a young kid to go buy pigeon feed for his fucking pigeons. I hit that fucking store. I go inside the store. I end up killing fucking chickens, some ducks. I, kill, I think I killed a dog. I don't know, but I killed some animals. But as we hit, we hit and I come to, after the wreck, I come to the fucking car smoking. The windshield's busted because my homegirl in the middle, she went through the windshield. She's laying over the dashboard on top of the fucking hood. My homie, I look at my homie, he's all dazed. Me and my homie get my homegirl and we pull her back. And when we pull her back, she has her fucking forehead just sliced open all the way on top. And blood's just leaking and I'm like, oh fuck. I fuck my homegirl's face up. All she tells me is run. So. As I'm thinking of running, I remember I dropped the pistol on the, on the floorboard of the car because I'm looking for it, I don't have it. Finally, I grab it, boom, I put it in my waist. The door's jammed from the wreck, so I can't get out, but the window had, you know, got fucked up, so it had kind of fell. So anyways, I get my homie's home. My homie has like a screwdriver or a hammer, I forgot, and I break the window. Now, all this time that I'm breaking the window and I pull my homegirl back, the cops ain't even there yet. I didn't know that the cops were maybe like four or five blocks behind me because Every red light I ran, they weren't gonna just run the red light the same way I did it. I did it, they have sirens and shit, but I was running them like, fuck it, I didn't care what happened. So they were far behind. I break the window, I get out. Now there's this alley I see, and I remember this alley when my father used to take me in his car, I remember this alley I could run down. So I run down the alley, I run down the alley, I get to the next street, I make a left, and I see this UPS van. And this UPS van, it's still running, you know? So I run and I get under it. I get under it, I'm thinking the cops ain't gonna see me. All of a sudden I hear, 
like, it sounds like horses' hooves, you know, they're, they're on the ground, it's going tsk, 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 and I'm like, what the fuck is that? And this big ass fucking German Shepherd, I mean, big as fuck, pure black, fucking dark ass eyes, comes running right up to the fucking UPS truck, and I'm thinking, fuck, he's gonna bite me? Fuck no, the fucker stops, and he starts circling around the UPS van, and I'm like, what the fuck? At that time, I didn't know that the UPS van was kicking off fumes, and the dog could only smell me up to the UPS van but he's running in a circle. Now, at this time, I don't know that this is a police dog. I'm thinking this is somebody's dog that just chased me down the alley, but he's a big fucking dog. And I'm like, fuck, so I wait, I wait, and I say, when he gets to the fucking far corner, when he circles around again, he gets to this far corner, I'm gonna break the other way. So I wait for him, he gets to the far corner, boom, I get out, I start running again. I hear the fucker right behind me. I jump a fence, I'm, I jump a fence, I hurdle the fence, I look back and this fucker just leaps in, whoa, like nothing. I'm saying, oh fuck, this fool's on me. Now I know he don't belong to someone else. I'm thinking now in my mind, I'm saying, fuck, this is a fucking canine. My homies have warned me before about the canines and told me how to get away from them. So I'm like, boom, I look, I'm, I'm running through this backyard. I look to the side and I see a fence and then it has a wall behind it. And I'm like, fuck, if I can hit this fence, get on the wall, pull myself up, this fucker ain't gonna be able to jump it. Sure enough, I hit the fence. I grab the wall, I pull myself up. As soon as I pull myself up, fucker barely misses me. You know what I mean, barely misses me. I feel the wind from his mouth just right at my leg and I'm like, fuck. So I'm on top of the wall, I'm like, oh, this fool can't jump up there, I'm gone. Well, as soon as I jump down, I hit the ground and as soon as I hit the ground, I try to get up and I can't get up. And I'm, what the fuck? My legs just like went out. Well, I didn't know when I wrecked, my knees had hit the steering wheel and I had split both of my knees right here. Well, all the adrenaline for me running, as soon as I guess I hit the ground, my legs just gave out. So now I'm pulling myself through some lady's backyard. The reason I know it's a lady, I'll tell you right now why I know it's a lady, but I'm pulling myself through this backyard. I can see the fucking chopper circling. I could hear all the cops everywhere. I hear the dog still. So I pull myself, my homie comes out of hiding behind a bush. I guess he ran one direction, I ran the other direction, but we ended up in the same fucking backyard. And this is like seven houses down from where we actually were actually wrecked. So I, I see my homie run up to me, he's like, what's up, get up, let's go. I go, I can't run, dog. Just help me, hide me somewhere. So he grabs me, I remember, and he's dragging me through the grass, and I'm telling him, hurry, because I can hear the fucking dog. It's barking and barking, and then I hear the cops, and I'm saying, okay, it's a fucking canine. I tell him, stash me somewhere. Well, he pulls me into this, this house and it got like a, 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 in the backyard, it got like a, 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 you know, like a patio. And in the patio, there's a, there's a pool table. And I tell him, fuck it, pull me to the pool table. The pool table has a green tarp over it. I guess they weren't using it. It had a green tarp over it. And I'm like, fuck, put me under. So he puts me under there. Now I'm trying to steady my breathing because I don't want the dog or the guy to hear me because they're searching. I can hear them searching through the yards or getting closer. Well, my homie, he gets up and he runs and he gets into the garage. There's a garage right there, there's a white door. He gets inside it, he closes the door and locks it. I can hear him. So I'm kicking back, I'm waiting, I'm waiting. And all of a sudden within fucking, I'd say maybe 15 to 20 seconds after I'm sitting there, the fucking tarp just busts in my face. It's the fucking dog and he fucking snatches my arm. Well, when he snatches my arm, he snatches my wrist. I grab like this and I fucking grab him to f by his mouth and I'm fucking like, oh, this fucker bit. He bit me like twice, once in the wrist, once in the arm. So I grab him and I'm gonna fucking rip his mouth open. I'm like, fuck this dog, I'm gonna kill this dog. You know, he already bit me twice. I've been bit by dogs, I hate being bit. So I grab this fucker and I'm about to fucking, by that time we slid out the other side of the pool table from the struggle, I'm about to rip this fuck. I'm gonna, I just wanna rip his mouth open. All of a sudden, boom, I just see a white light, boom. And fucking everything goes black. When I wake up, I fucking wake up and this dog has a hold of my arm and he's fucking just shaking it and I see my whole arm just, you know, as he's shaking, my whole arm is just flinging back and forth and I'm like, what the fuck? So I sock the dog, I try to sock the dog and he hits him in his nose, he lets go. I guess the cop that runs me said some shit to him, he grabbed the dog, pulled him off. The cops get on me, they handcuff me, okay, they handcuff me. Now the cop comes and he puts his fucking foot on my face, he says, where's your homie at? Where's your homie at? I know my homie's in the garage, but I'm not gonna give up my homie, you know? I'm not, I'm not gonna give him up, I'm caught, you know? Maybe they won't catch him, they'll just take me. Well, he's asking me, he's asking me, and he has this fucking canine, and he's snapping in my face, he's snapping. And I'm scared, I'm only 14 years old, the cops got me, you know what I mean? I don't know where, in the, I'm in the enemy hood. I just shot at a motherfucker, so I'm thinking, damn, you know, when they got my ass. Well, he's snapping, and he's snapping. He asked me again, he says, I'm gonna ask you one more time, 
if you don't tell me where he is, I'm gonna let the dog go again. He goes, where is he at? I don't tell him shit, he lets the dog go. Now the dog gets on my leg. That's the most excruciating pain I've ever felt. You know what I mean? Like I stated earlier, to all you young kids that are young, I'm 13, 14 years old. At that age, you're supposed to be at Disneyland, you know what I mean? Chuck E. Cheese, you know, birthday parties. You're not supposed to be out just shooting at people, stealing cars, running from the cops, you know? But I chose to do that. Those were my own choices. Well, he lets him go. He's chewing on my fucking leg. I'm screaming. I'm screaming. I'm asking him to get the dog off me. Never once did I give up my homie. He takes the dog off me. At that time, another canine comes in. And I'm like, oh, fuck, he's going to stick another one on me. Now there's two canines. Well, lo and behold, that canine runs up to that fucking white door, and he's jumping on the door, and he's barking. And they're giving commands to my homie inside. Hey, come out. I'm going to put the dog on you. Come out. Unlock it. I hear my homie inside. All right, I'm coming out. I'm coming out. He unlocks the door. Shit, as soon as that door opens, that fucking canine jumps on him. Hits him in the chest, pushes him down. I hear my homie screaming. I mean, it was, it was ironic because I, my homie heard me screaming. I heard him screaming after. They chew his ass up, both his legs. They didn't get his arms because he put his arms behind his back. They handcuffed him. And I guess, from what I found out, whenever they release a canine on someone, they have to let them bite you. You have to remember that. They can't just let a canine go, bite you, or then the next time tell them not to bite you, and then to bite you. They can't tell the dog to do back and forth because the dog's going to get confused. So he has to bite you every time. So they get us both. They take us back to where the car's at. The fucking car's totaled. That fucker smashed. It just got smashed like a little fucking box. My homegirls are handcuffed and everything. You know, like the ambulance are attending to her. And I tell my I look at my homegirl. She's like, well, I'm okay, I'm okay. I'm like, all right. So they take us. From there, they put us in the paramedics. They take us to, a, to some hospital in Pico Rivera. It's called the Dog and Cat Hospital. The Dog and Cat Hospital. They take us there. You know, they're cleaning our wounds and shit. And then they're asking, how old are we? How old are we? I tell them, I think I'm 14, homie's 14. They, we're about the same age, 14 and 15. They tell us, we're taking you to the general hospital, to the jail ward. Now, the jail ward is for adults, but I guess if you're 14 years old and up, they take you to the jail ward. So they take me to the 13th floor of the jail ward. I get to the jail ward. You know, the nurses are being nice and everything. They clean my wounds. All of a sudden, I hear my grandfather's voice. He's in the hallway. He's talking shit to the arresting officer because he's telling him, do you know my grandson's 14 years old? You know, you sick the canines on him. You know, I guess my grandfather spoke to the lady that that house belonged to because as that dog was biting me, I didn't know that the lady had came out the house and seen the dog biting me and told the cops to take the dog off me. She's seen that I was just a kid, so she's telling the cops, take, take the dog off him. I didn't hear that. I only hear my own screaming. You know, I'm fucking yelling. The dog's biting the shit out of me. So my grandfather's arguing with this cop. They come in. They come back in. They tell me, hey, we're taking you to juvenile hall. So I'm like, all right, whatever. We go to juvenile hall. I get to juvenile hall. We go to court in a couple of days. They let me out. I go home. My fucking arms this big. You know, my, my legs this big. I can barely walk. Can't even move my fucking right side. So, you know, I got fucked up that time. So, lo and behold, I heal. Everything's cool. You know what I mean? I go to, I don't even go to jail for that one. So, lo and behold, we're kicking it. I grab my little cousin. It's about, maybe about two, three months later. I grab my little cousin. I tell him, hey. Let's go over here to this spot, you know what I mean? I got this girl pregnant, you know, she's going to have a baby shower. Let's go over here. He says, yeah, but it's close to the enemy hood. I said, man, don't trip. Those fools ain't going to know. So we go over there. We get inside. We're kicking it. I get to the kitchen, and I'm rolling a joint. You know what I mean? I'm rolling a joint. And I, I, I remember I'm about to lick the joint, and I hear the front door open, and I look to the side, and four motherfuckers walk in. And the first dude, I recognize him. I'm like, oh, fuck, this fool has my ass. This fool right here has already erased motherfuckers. So, and what I mean by erase, you should know what I mean. He erased them, got rid of them, and I'm like, oh shit, I ain't got a gun, I ain't got a knife, I ain't got nothing, he's coming in the door. I'm thinking, how in the fuck does this motherfucker know we're here? Well, I was fucking with his homegirls about three months previous, and they got upset, and his homegirl decides to let them know where we're at. So we go, you know what I mean, we're in there, I roll a joint, I'm licking it, he, he comes in, has a few words with my cousin, you know what I mean? My cousin tells him to step outside. The dude walks out. My aunt's in there because it's a baby shower. They're telling us to calm down, whatever. As my cousin's coming out the end, I fucking pull a knife out, give it to him. I grab me something. We go outside. We end up whacking these motherfuckers in front of everybody. What I mean by whacking is we stab these dudes. I mean, one of the dudes was stabbed so much that they took him to the hospital. You know what I mean? And no more, we didn't get caught. 
but I knew that these dudes had the reputation of coming back. So about a week later, I'm kicking it and I'm barbecuing some steaks on the grill. We're inside the apartment complex, kicking it and barbecuing on the grill. And I look up and I see four individuals walk up. One got a shotgun, the other one got a handgun, the other one got a handgun. I figure I'm through. I have a nine millimeter in my back. I had just bought a nine millimeter, I have it in my back. So I pull it out, we all aim, boom. At the same time, we all aim. And the older dude says, what's up, man? You know, I guess the dude that we had stabbed made up a story. He made up a story that I asked him to come and kick it with us and that I set him up and that we jumped him and we stabbed him and that's how it happened. It didn't happen like that. The dude sta slapped my aunt, so I stabbed the shit out of him for slapping my aunt. You know, I can't go home and face my family, them being all gang members and tell them, hey, I was at a party, your sister and my aunt got slapped and I didn't do shit. You know, so this older dude asked me, hey man, you set up my homie? I said, I didn't set nobody up. Your homie came and slapped my aunt. So he asked me, well, who's your aunt? As soon as I told him who my aunt was, he started slapping the shit out of one of his homies that had the gun. He started pistol whipping with the gun. Boom, he's pistol whipping with the gun. I'm like, hey, wait up, man. You know, dude wasn't even there. You know what I mean? A lot of times that I got into incidents, I noticed that when the truth comes out, the older dudes that, that are taking care of business always start either slapping their homies, beating their homies, pistol whipping them. And I'm wondering why they're doing that. They came with them to handle business. But yet when the truth comes out, they start beating on them. Several occasions I have had dudes beating on their homies behind me just giving the truth. I feel that the truth will outlast anything. A lie changes, you know what I mean? And dude was running his mouth, but as soon as I told the older dude what happened, they put the guns down, he starts pistol whipping his homie, I ask him to leave him alone. Then I get a conversation with the older dude, you know what I mean? And I tell him, look man, this is what happened. I ran him down what happened, I let him know who my family was. He said, cool, nothing will come from this. All right, cool, I'm, I ain't tripping. So about, I say three days later, me and my homie are kicking it, and I'm, I'm selling glass at that time, but it's, it's peanut butter crank. I'm selling peanut butter crank, right? And something tells me, go inside and check on my, on my girlfriend, you know? So I get up, I go check on my girlfriend. As soon as I'm walking to the front door, I hear some voices. So I look out the window, and I see the same exact dude that I stabbed. He has my homie on the ground with the shotgun to his face, and he's asking him where I'm at. Now he's asking him where I'm at, I left my gun in another apartment. And I'm like, fuck, I don't have my gun on me. This fool has my homie. I'm like, he's gonna kill my homie. He doesn't kill him. He, he's asking only for me, you know what I mean? And I knew they were coming back again. So what I did was I made a phone call. I called their homies. I said, check it out. This fool came back again, you know what I mean? And he had my homie with a shotgun to his face. My homie's upset, you know. I'm either gonna take it to my older homies and we're gonna go over there to your hood and fuck your homie off, or you guys are gonna fuck him off because from my understanding, it was supposed to be over. But you always gotta remember, when you're in the gang scene and you tell somebody that it's the end, it's never the end because somebody's always related to somebody else. You know what I mean? Someone has a little brother, you know? The dude that I stabbed, he ended up picking up a life sentence. About five years later, I'm kicking at this apartment and we're getting high and three or four or five dudes walk in and I recognize one of the dudes, he looks real familiar. And I ask him, hey, what's your name? He tells me his name and then he tells me, my brother's so-and-so and I'm like, fuck. How am I gonna tell this kid that I'm the one that did that to his brother's face, you know? And then he comes and he tells me, hey, um, you know who my brother is, man? And I'm like, man, I don't wanna tell this young kid. who well, he's younger than me. He's not really that young. He's maybe about four or five years young younger than me, but I don't want to tell him what I did to his brother because he's gonna get upset and he's, I'm gonna have to hurt the little fucker. But I tell him anyways, man, look, this is what happened with your brother. He was there with your homie. Your, ho your homie fucked up. Your brother got served because of your homie, but it's all over and done with. So I ended up kicking with this little youngster, you know what I mean? And he was a solid dude, you know what I mean? He was good and everything. And he tells me, hey, you know, um, he says, the fool's from, he says another gang, he goes, I've been trying to put in work on him, but I can't find him. Well, they're the enemies of us too. So I tell him, well, check it out. I'll go with you. What we'll do is we'll take two cars. The front car, we'll leave with girls inside. Now, this is how I used to do it. The front car will have all women inside. The back car will have all guys inside with the firearms loaded up with the guns. What we would do is we would let the homegirls cruise up, call these dudes. Now, these dudes see all women in a car. They're thinking, fuck it. They roll up on them. You know what I mean? Hey, girl, what's up? My homegirls whistle, call these dudes. We're, we're a little bit ways back with no lights on. As soon as the dudes walk up to the car, my homegirls know as soon as they see us come up, they leave. So we drive up, they leave, 
this little youngster don't reach out the window. He jumps out the window, runs, chases the dudes in the backyard. I hear a gang of firing going on. I mean, he must have unloaded the whole clip on these dudes. He runs back in, he gets in, and I see him, he's white as a ghost, you know, and I'm like, what the fuck? I take off, right? We leave, we're in a G, right? We leave. As we're going down the street, I'm looking at him, right? And he puts his head between his legs and he, he just throws up inside the car and I'm like, fuck. I ain't never seen anybody throw up. I ain't never threw up. You know what I mean? I think I threw up one time. I seen something and I threw up one time, but I don't know what he did, but he threw up in the car and I'm like, fuck, let's get another car. Fuck this car. It's starting to smell. You know, he, he threw up a lot in there and he's telling me, oh, just take me home. Just take me home. I'm like, I'm not going to your hood to take you home. Fuck that. If I go to his hood to take him home, he lives like right in the heart of his neighborhood. I ain't going in there. So I tell him, I'll leave you at the corner. I leave him at the corner. He goes home. About, I say about five days later, he calls me again. He tells me, hey man, these fools came, came back, shot two of my homies. What's up, could you take me on another mission? I'm like, look, man. I told him, look, like this time I'm about 16 years old, I tell him, look, man, our hoods don't get along, but we're not really enemies. But since that happened with your brother and you know what happened, I'm gonna take you again, you know? So I go and I pick this youngster up. He comes running out of his house. He looks happy, you know, he don't look the same way he looked that one day when I dropped him off. He looks like a whole new person. He comes in, he got this rifle. It's, it's, I think it's a 22 rifle and it has a banana clip. And this fucking banana clip is see-through. And I'm looking at it, I'm like, damn, this fucking, I mean, this banana clip must be about this long. And, it, and it, it, it's shaped like a banana and it's loaded all the way down. And I'm like, what are you gonna do? He's like, look, I went over here and I wrote on the wall. He goes, these fools are gonna come and cross me out and I wanna be across the street and I'm gonna light them up. And I was like, damn, this fool's young. He's like 13 years old. I'm thinking, how would a 13 year old think of something like that? I've never thought of that and I've thought of everything. I've thought of jogging through the park. I've thought of jogging up on guys with a wig on. I've tried everything, but this dude's talking about, he wrote his name and shit on the wall. He's gonna wait for them to cross it out. So we sat there. We must have sat there for like an hour, man. I'm already getting tired of sitting there. We smoked like three, four joints. We smoked the lovely. I'm high as fuck. We're drinking. We're in the G ride. I'm like, fuck, we're sitting in a G ride here on the main street. He's like, man, they're gonna come. They're gonna come. I say about half an hour after he tells me they're gonna come, here comes two guys. And they're coming. They cross the street. We're watching them. You know, we could see they're gangsters because at that time, you know, for you young kids that don't know, you know, back then you could spot a gangster anywhere. You could see a crowd of 50 people and there could be two or three people sticking out because of the way they dress, the way they look, the way they walk, the way they talk, the way they look at you. You know they're gang related. Nowadays, you can't even tell. But back then we see these guys walking across the street and I'm like, okay, we got them. We got them. I said, what do you want me to do? You want me to? He's like, no, don't drive up on them. I'm going to walk up on them. I'm like, this kid's crazy. You know what I mean? He wants to get off the car and handle his business and then come back to the car, you know? For any of you know that have went on missions, from a motherfucker to handle business and come back to the car, it's not him handling business, it's you getting away. That's the number one thing, getting away. So he handles his business, and I always remember how this situation looked because I'm watching it like I'm watching a TV. He walks up to the two dudes, they're spraying on the wall, and he just starts letting off on them. And I always remember these dudes were like, I always told people that, if you can ever make a motherfucker, a motherfucker pop lock, you know, because every time he hit him, the dudes were like just shaking, you know, like they were, they were pop locking, like they were, and he was just hitting both of them. Boom. He let the whole clip off on both these fools. Either one of them hit the floor. They were able to run. I mean, they, they were leaking. I know they were leaking because he shot them a lot of times. He comes back, the gun's smoking, the clip's empty. He fucking emptied the whole thing. And I think it was a 32 or a 38 round clip. He empties the whole fucking thing on him. And I'm like, I look at him, he gets in the car. He's fucking stone white again. I'm like, look, who? if you're going to throw up, tell me you're going to throw up. I'll oh, stop the car. Shit, we get about three blocks. He's like, stop the car, stop the car. I'm like, what, what? Stop the car. Fuck, I stop the car. He gets out, he's throwing up. I tell him, get the fuck in the car. We're only three blocks away from where he did the actual shooting. I'm like, get in the car. He gets in the car. We go. He tells me, hey, let's go kick it at my house. At this time, he had moved a little bit out of his hood. So we go kick it at his house. I love to kick it at his house. His sisters, he got like four of them. They're beautiful. So I start messing with them. You know what I mean? I'm being with the sisters. The phone rings one day. I answer it. I never should have answered it. It was his brother calling from prison. 
I answered it, hello. His brother, his brother's 18, he got a life sentence. I think he got like something like 100 to life, 90 to life or something for killing somebody in, in, in a liquor store. So I answered the phone, hello. Was, you know, ex collect call from this state penitentiary. Move. I said, I accept it. Hello? He's like, who's this? And me, instead of saying I'm someone else, I tell him who it is. He fucking blows it on the other end. I'm like, I put the phone down. I call one of the sisters. I'm like, your brother's on the phone. They get on the phone with the brother. The little brother gets on the phone. He starts talking to his older brother. Now his older brother wants to talk to me. So I get back on the phone. And I'm young. This dude's a little bit older. He tells me, hey, man, what the fuck are you doing taking my brother around handling his business? I said, check it out. Your brother calls me. I don't go call him. He said, your brother calls me. You left him out here. He's not my responsibility. He's yours. You know, because I'm a strong believer in if you have a little brother and a little sister, it's your responsibility to guide them in the right way. Me, I guided my little brother in the wrong way. You know what I mean? I took my little brother on missions. Me and him did so much shit that sometimes I feel guilty about the things that I took my little brother to do. But in my mind, I know that my little brother, if he ever talks on here, I think he's just a little bit more treacherous than I am, a little bit more dangerous. And he's just a little bit more crazy because he's the type of motherfucker that he'll let your air out and he won't give a fuck. He'll want to eat right after, go fucking drink something. He don't throw up. He don't get sick. He doesn't get scared. He doesn't duck. You know what I mean? We've been shot at several times. We stand in the front yard. Fool came by with a fucking Mossberg shotgun hanging out the window. And I remember this dude fucking let off that fucking shotgun. And I hit the ground and when I look up, my little brother just standing there, you know, and he's, he don't duck. And I ask him, why don't you duck? He says, what happens if I duck and dude shoots me when I'm on the floor? Fuck it, I'm gonna stay still, let him shoot. You know, and I wish I could bring him to speak to you guys as well because I'm trying to find him, I can't find him. I'm trying, but he's a little more treacherous than I am, you know? But he was my little brother and I feel guilty that if you have a little brother, you shouldn't take him through the stages that I took him through. You know what I mean? Because I used to think of things and then tell my little brother, let's go, he wouldn't hesitate. We'd go do something and then we wouldn't want to come outside at all. I shared that before, we wouldn't come outside at all. Just for what we did out there on the streets, you know? So this little youngster that I got with me, now that his brother said it's okay and he can roll with me, I keep this little youngster with me because number one, he's not afraid to handle business. Number two, he doesn't run his mouth. He's not the type of motherfucker that will go around and tell a story because if you do something to get away with it, when you tell it again, it's like doing it all over again. I share these because these happened many, many years ago. I went and did my time for most of them and I'm sharing with you guys what I've experienced to let you know everything is not good. When after I ran with this little youngster, I ended up going to juvenile camp for a whole year. You're only supposed to be do three months, but because I was in juvenile camp and I was from a gang and because my gang got along with a lot of gangs around us, but what happened was I went and did a little juvenile time. I got out, got to the park. There's another gang, another gang, and another gang with my gang there. And I'm wondering what the fuck are these other gangs doing here? Well, what they're doing is they want to all kick it together and declare war on everybody else. So now when I go back to juvenile, when I'm in juvenile the first time, I'm running into gangs that I get along with. When I circle around and come back the next time, this is the bad part. I come back the next time, all these dudes that I were kicking with, they're all my enemies now. Now I got to fight with all of them. And they weren't my enemies to begin with. They were the enemies of this dude's hood. But since we get along, we probably got along with this hood and they didn't. They did and they didn't. So we'd party with them. This hood would come, we'd get into it with them, but we're with them and it wouldn't work like that. So we said, fuck it. Since that's happening and it keeps on happening, you know, you guys are kicking it with someone and we're getting into shit. It happened. We're kicking here one day, right? We're kicking it with these dudes and three carloads pull up and we're like, who the fuck is that, dog? And these dudes tell us who it is and we're like, what the fuck? How do you guys bring these motherfuckers? We get into with them, shots are fucking exchanged. Somebody dies. On that side, it happened. We had the, we had the meeting and we said, fuck it, let's get along. We declare war on everybody. I went back to juvenile hall. I had the roughest time in juvenile hall. That was my roughest time ever, waiting to go to placement. I fucking must have fought like 15 times, went to the hole like 10 times because of the fact that all these dudes I used to kick it with, now they know they're my arch enemy. Not because we did anything to their hood, but because we get along with a hood that don't get along with them, so that just makes them my en enemy instantly. So I got all these fucking enemies. I go to camp, and there must be like 15 motherfuckers I don't get along with. And when you get to camp, you have to line them up. For you kids that don't know, when you go to juvenile camp, you have to line up your enemies one at a time. And you're going to fight with every one of them. Because if you don't fight with one, they're going to label you as 
that a loser, a level, whatever you want to call it, and you're going to get all your shit took, all your story is going to get taken, you're going to fucking pay somebody to take care of you. In other words, you're going to be like a punk, you're going to be like somebody's woman. You know, everything you get from your family, he's going to get what he wants out of it and then give you what he wants to give you. You know what I mean? So you have to remember, doing time ain't all what it seems to be. Don't get me wrong, before, when I went to prison the first time, as soon as you get to jail, you get a care package, boom. Soups, coffee, tobacco, whatever you want. Then your homies send you something, you got shit like you just went to store. You go to jail now, they won't even give you a fucking shot of coffee. You know, you sit in a room maybe like 23 hours out of the day, they let you go eat, use the bathroom when you have to, but you're in a room, the door's locked, and you sit there for hour after hour, no books, no games to play, you can't use the phone, nothing like that. You just sit there and wait until you go to court, and then you gotta wait again until they send you either to placement, camp, and as you're going through that whole process, you're fighting left and right, left and right. And I mean, you can't show no kind of weakness because if you do, like I said, they're gonna take advantage of you. They're gonna take your money that comes, your store that comes, whatever thing you have that you think is yours, it's not yours anymore. You have to give it up. Before you wanna go to juvenile hall, you wanna go to jail, you have to remember, those things come at a very, very large price. Your record and your jacket just gets bigger and bigger, and every time you go to court and they see you, that's the first thing the judge sees, your record. If you have a bad one, he's gonna send you to the most nastiest places there are, and they got nasty ass places where the staff there treat you like shit. They don't say, uh, uh, how you doing mijo, or how you doing baby kid, no. Hey motherfucker, you know what I mean, or hey stupid. You know, they talk to you very, very bad. They're not your parents, you know, they just, they, they, they make you feel like, you're so little, you're so small. Like, you don't wanna come back anymore, but you know once you get out there, you're gonna do the same thing over and over. I knew at 15 years old, when I put my teardrop on my face, that I was destined for prison. When I came home and everybody cried because I had a teardrop on my face, my grandmother was the only one not crying because she knew that I was gonna go to prison eventually. And I already knew, I just didn't know when. I didn't know I was gonna go at 18. I thought maybe 21, 25, but I went at 18. You know, and at 18 years old, you're supposed to be graduating high school, going to your prom. I didn't go to no prom. I didn't graduate high school. I graduated high school in prison. You know what I mean? And that's not the place to graduate. Yeah, they gave me a gown and a hat and took one picture, but I didn't get to go and party with my homies, my homegirls, you know, my friends from school. Fuck no. I made it till the 10th grade and that was it. By the 10th grade, I had a girl pregnant. You know what I mean? I had a responsibility now. Now I gotta be a man and I'm still just a kid. You know, so when you got those years as being a kid, they used to tell me, hey, be with all the women you can, either you're young, do everything now that you're young. When you get older, you're gonna wish you were young again. Now I see that, now that I'm older, yeah, I wish I was young again, because I would've did certain things different. Not saying that I sit here and I hate my lifestyle. No, at times I love my lifestyle. There, is there was times before when I loved to put fear into people. You know, just to look at them in a certain way and you see them shake or you see their eyes move a certain way, you know you got them. I used to be that individual. Nowadays, I'm not that individual anymore. I don't promote violence. I'm a violent motherfucker when it comes down to it, you know, but I got that guy, that bad, bad person and locked him up so down deep inside that I don't want to let him out because if he comes out, I know I'm going back to jail. You know, I took so many risks out there being a young man, 14, 15, 16, stabbing people, jumping people, People that I didn't even know, you know, maybe they got something with my homies down the road and I was the one that always, I didn't want to raise my hand and say, I'll do it. I was just the one to say, give me the shit, I'll go handle it. And I always used to do that over and over and it cost me so much. It cost me my wife, my kids, most of my life. You know, I've been out of prison maybe like 10 years now and it only seems like a year. It went by so fast, you know, and in jail, you know, you must get a routine down and you must follow all rules, you know, and rules are there, they're not meant to be broken. You can bend them, stretch them, put them in any way you want, but you can't break them, you know what I mean? And I, sh I tell you this because people glamorize being a gangster, being in prison. If you really think about it, you shower with men, you're around men all day, you're not around no women. If you're lucky, you'll get family visits, but if you kill somebody or you almost kill somebody, you're not, never gonna see your wife, you're never gonna spend three days with her in a little house for, for three days with your kids and your wife, you're not gonna get that. They don't give that to, to those type of people, the people that are very violent. You know, I used, to be, I used to like to be one of the most violent motherfuckers I could be. You know, anything that came about and I felt I was the right man for the job, I would just do it. I wouldn't ask, I'll just do it. I wouldn't raise my hand because I didn't wanna be picked on 
and say, okay, it's your turn, and then me to say, nah, I never, asked. yes, I did, I asked to do something, I raised my hand so much, that now this next motherfucker that has a little bit more juice, he raised my hand for me, you know, and in juvenile hall, it's not like that, in juvenile hall, you get to keep your pride and everything tucked inside, because dudes will talk about your mother, talk about your sisters, talk about your brother, talk about your girlfriend, you know, they'll try to break you in any way they can, because there's children in there, but a lot of those guys think, at a higher level, you know, you're, when, when you're in the gang life, you know, you see things that the average youngster wouldn't see, you know what I mean? I've seen people get shot, I've seen people get knocked the fuck out, get their pockets checked, pulled out like a rabbit, and just left there, you know, and me, being young, I'm thinking, man, I should go help that guy, but then when I try to go help him, my homies, man, leave that motherfucker there and kick him in the face again, you know, and make me kick him in the face again, you know? On my first mission, I got took by my family member, you know, and I didn't want to go. I was fucking scared. I was only like 13, 14 years old, 15, I was 15, and they were taking me to go handle business, and I, I'm not going to sit there and say I wasn't scared. I was scared as fuck, but after I handled my business, then it became like a routine to me. I wanted to find the individuals that were putting in work in every hood, I wanted to find that individual and I wanted to fuck him off. And to tell you the truth, a lot of times I did find the individual and I did get with their program and I see them nowadays. And those things are of the past, but the animosity is still there. You know what I mean? And when you want to be that motherfucker, remember, your reputation will exceed you. Right now I'm dealing with something that ain't even none of my business. I wasn't even there, but they put me as the culprit. And it's fucked up because... Who am I to go tell what really took place? That's none of my business. Remember, I wasn't there. But if you want to be that gangster and you think you're that gangster, go ahead, more power to you. But you want to be the best gangster you can be. Don't half step nothing because everything follows you. Everything follows you. I was at a party one time. I don't even know this fucking dude. And he came up and socked me in my mouth, busted my mouth, and I don't even know this guy. I've never seen him. I don't know who he was. Afterwards, I found out that I had stabbed his brother like six months previous. His brother, I don't know this guy. He bust me in my mouth in front of everybody, sat me on my ass. I'm getting up wiping my mouth. I don't even know this guy. I'm trying to ask him who in the fuck are you? He's just cussing at the top of his fucking, at the top of his breath, just cussing at me. I'm like, I don't even know this dude. But that's a consequence that you suffer. You want to be from a gang? You have to remember, every fucking thing your homies get into, you're gonna be held accountable. Especially if you're one of the homies that is always there. Cause you got homies that are always there, like I want it to be always there. You know what I mean? And always a woman wants to be next to you. There's no room for women in a gang life. That's how I feel. Before I used to have my homegirls and feel cool about them, but now I feel that there's no room for women. Because when you go to jail, there's no women there. There's only men. If you're a woman in jail, you know what you are, you know? So there's no room for any women. If I get on the phone and I'm calling to get a hold of somebody and a woman answers, I don't want to speak to a woman, I want to speak to a man. Because he could put himself in here, she'll never come in here. She can get dealt with out there, but in here, in jail, when you're in jail, you have nowhere to run to, nowhere to hide. You have to deal with everything face value. You're not going to be able to go to the next door and think you're all good. Shit's going to follow you everywhere you go, you know, because, you know, it used to be where you used to write on the wall and you put your name and then your neighborhood. Now it's flipped backwards. You put your neighborhood, then your name. Wait a minute, it's supposed to be you representing your hood, not your hood representing you, but everything's asshole backwards now. A lot of stuff is similar and the same, but a lot of things nowadays are changed. You know, there's no camaraderie anymore. I'll be the first to let it be known that the camaraderie is not there anymore. Before, motherfucker would go out of his way to bring your old lady to visit. Now, if you ain't got no gas and you ain't got no money, your old lady ain't coming up. This guy's not gonna just volunteer to have his old lady pick your old lady up from 10 miles away and then bring her over to visit you. It's not gonna happen. So you youngsters that are running around out there right now, believe me, take it from someone who knows. When you go to jail, you gotta remember, are you gonna be a South Sider or a rag rider? That's what they say. If you're a South Sider, you're gonna put in work. But remember, 80% of the work you put in is how you represent yourself how you stay clean, how you follow rules, how you talk to people, respect people. The other 10% is just putting in work. People think it's the other way around. No, 80% of it is representing, the other 10% is putting in work. It's not 10% of representing yourself and 80% of putting in work. It doesn't work like that. Because remember, you're in a jail, you're in a cell, so you can only get to people at a certain time. You know, I shared a lot of things up here and I share it with you guys because I don't want to glorify anything I've did, but this has been my lifestyle. And I've shown, I've, I've said it before that 
Some of us have a choice, some of us don't. See, I was bred from a young age to be somebody that maybe, in reality, I didn't want to be. But I became that person from a young, young age where before I used to hurt a motherfucker, I could be talking to you, we could be talking, I see somebody, I go handle him, smash his ass, he's bleeding and everything, come right back to you and just be able to talk to you again like nothing ever happened. You know what I mean? And people used to ask me, how in the fuck do you do that? How do you turn it on like a light switch and then just turn it off? I don't know. It was just inside me where I could just handle something, come right back and be the same person. You know, that, that's a bad, bad person because I had no conscience of what I did. And I heard a guy tell me before, I have no conscience. Me, I had a conscience, but I used to just tuck it way back where I say, well, I just did that because it was the right thing to do. And, you know, they'll get even and I'll get even again. We'll just go back and forth like a tennis game, you know, and, you know, it's, 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 you're so caught up in the moment that when I went to prison the first time, I'm going to be honest, they offered me three years to go to prison. I ended up getting 15. But they offered me three. The reason I didn't take the three because I thought, I can beat this. I didn't beat it. I lost. They offered me three years. I would have been out in a year and a half. Instead, I went and they gave me 15 and I did seven of that. But I was offered three. Why? Because my pride, me being that motherfucker that I thought I was, oh, fuck it, I'm taking it all the way to the box. And I lost. Went to prison for seven years. And the first seven, oh man, it was... It was dynamite. I had fun. I rode, I, I rode around the yard with the homies. We smoked, bug, drank, had fun, fucking put in work, went to the hole, got out. But now, it's not the same. You're not going to go to the yard and smoke weed and put in work. Nah, because all the homies you know are either dead, doing life in the shoe, or on the other side. Where they say the grass is greener. I don't know. I haven't, I, I haven't been that side. I, I never choose to go on that side, and I don't knock nobody for going to that side. People have their own reasons. But me, myself, I'm a strong believer in when you were on the streets and you were putting in work and they stabbed you or they shot you, you went home, the hospital home, and you healed up. Then you went back out there and began banged again. What's the difference of going in jail? And in jail, you get poked. Why will you arc while your door shut? Why lock it up? Go yourself, heal up, let yourself heal up, come back and handle your business. If you were doing it like a gangster, why not do it in prison the same way? You're just in a different environment. But if you're a real motherfucker and you can call yourself a solid self-sider, then you should be able to adapt to anything that you find yourself in. If you find you could put me on a street corner, on any fucking street corner, give me a sack and I'll be able to deal drugs. You can set me on any street corner, give me five women, I'll pimp them all. Okay, you can do that. You can put me anywhere and I'll be able to become a product of my environment. Because I'll watch, I'll study, and I'll just become a part of that. Where, yeah, I might stick out like a sore thumb, but in reality, I became a part of that environment. I don't feel that I was ever institutionalized. No, I feel that I just came accustomed to doing the same fucking thing that over and over again. And they would tell me that I'm crazy, that I'm crazy to come out here and I got busted for dealing drugs. I go to jail, come back out. I'm going to deal drugs again and expect a different outcome. How is that? I'm going to get the same outcome. I'm going to get caught again, and I'm going to go to jail again. But in my mind, I'm thinking, nah, I could do it this way. Maybe I'll just deal with people over 30. A motherfucker over 30 is going to tell on you. It doesn't matter. If he gets caught with dope, I mean, I got caught fucking 100 feet outside this door. And I was in here talking, walked out the door, did something, and got caught and went to jail. That quick, you know, it can happen anywhere because of the fact that you always have to remember you have good motherfuckers and you have bad motherfuckers and they run hand in hand. You know what I mean? You got to figure out who you're going to fuck with, who you're going to take care of business with. The best advice I ever got was if you do it, do it yourself because only you know how you want it done. But if I send my homie and he doesn't do it right, I'm going to fuck him off. Because I should have went and did it myself, but I sent him and expected him to do the same thing that I would do in my shoes. That's impossible. He doesn't think like me. He's not going to think and do the same things I would do in this situation. But we tend to think that. I see a lot of older dudes on their homies for not doing what they told them. You should have fucking did it yourself. You know what I mean? You sent a motherfucker to do what you would do in this situation. How the fuck does he know what you were going to do? You got your own mind, they got their own mind. You know what I mean? That's why I look around and I see all these youngsters running around and oh, my homie told me to come over here and do this. And I'm looking at him and I'm telling him, man, your homie said you to do the wrong fucking thing. You know what I mean? Why didn't he come? And I ask him, why didn't your homie come? Why didn't he send you? Oh, because he wants to take the credit for all the work you're putting in. But he's gonna make the call and he's gonna be like, hey man, I got that done. He didn't do shit. He just told you to go do it, you handled it. 
and he's getting all the credit. You know, he's a vulture. You got to remember, you have those motherfuckers everywhere you go. You have them in jail. You have them out here on the streets. You know, they want to tell you, do this, do that. And then they take all the credit. And they're the ones shining. When in all reality, you were the one that put in all the work. He was the motherfucker who just verbally gave you the command. You know, so you have to remember, if you want to be your own man, and you want to be that gangster that everybody looks up to, well then, you have to be your own man. You have to handle your own business. I've never asked anybody to go do something that I wouldn't do myself. When I was in prison, and I shared before, when I used to, you know, run away a tear or yard and all that, before I told anybody to do anything, I did it myself. Right when I got there, I was the first motherfucker to handle business so that when I would ask somebody else to do it, and they would run to their homies and say, well, why don't he go with us? His homies would tell him he will go with us. He already handled his business. He's not telling you to do something he wouldn't do. That's the best advice I got, man. If you're going to do it, do it yourself and by yourself. You know what I mean? I hear motherfuckers every day tell me, I don't need a gang. I'm my own man. I can't knock him and tell him he's wrong because I was never my own man. Today, a little bit I'm my own man, but I still got my hood. I still got to represent. I still got to suffer the, the, the repercussions of whatever my hood does. If they put a light on all of us, I get the light too. I'm no different than anybody else. Even though I put in work and lost all of my life when I was a young man, all the people I stabbed, all the mothers I hurt, all the people I hurt along the way, my family, I can't take none of that back and I can't make it all better. All I got to do now is make sure everything I do accordingly now, that it's the right thing. I'm not saying that I don't get high and I don't go out there and party and I don't sell drugs. I'll be a motherfucking liar if I told you that. You know what I mean? But today I think in a different fashion. You know what I mean? I don't think of sending my homeboy. I don't go get my homies to handle business. I don't run and get on the phone and call my homies to come 20 down to come and handle my business. Fuck no, I'm my own man. If I fucking did something, then I got to suffer the consequence what it comes with. You know what I mean? And I share that with everybody. I'm a strong believer in you get the fucking consequence you get is how you carry yourself. If you've been around and you know better, then you should get off, you should get fucked off because you know better. But if you're a beginner and you're a new guy to the scene, then they should just talk to you or make you do something. They shouldn't fucking fuck you off. You don't know no better. When I was younger, man, I used to roll around and pull my gun out everywhere I've, until my homies got a hold of me and fucking slapped me up and fucking made me put my gun away and told me, what the fuck are you doing? Why are you pulling that thing out? Why do you keep pulling it out? And I thought I pulled it out to look cool. Nah, the only time you pull it out is to use it. You don't just pull it out to show it. You know what I mean? And I had to learn that. I had to learn that very, very fucked up. They spoke to me in a way where I, I didn't allow anybody to speak to me in that way, but yet because I was in the wrong and I was doing something that I shouldn't have been doing, when on all reality, I thought it was the right thing. I thought roll by my homies and tell them I got this and show them it. They fucking blew it. By the time I got back, they chewed my ass out because I shouldn't have pulled nothing out. So I give that advice that, you know, there's things you're gonna do in life that are gonna affect other people, not just yourself. I've affected me in so bad of a way that I got my kids are grown adults and they're already adults. They don't need me anymore. Now I didn't need them in the beginning. Now I need them. Now they don't need me, you know, and it's a fucked up situation, but I share it with you, Mark, you know what I mean? I'll share some more with you, Mark. All right, Johnny. All right. Thank you, man.